you're going to get a small glimpse of what infrastructure is being built up here every year. So um, please give it up for all of the people of our various infrastructure crews. Um, and we'll start with Leon and the um, 32C3 knock review. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, this is uh, the knock talk. So I'll start with the bad news. Um, we had no sauna this year. Um, <laughs> the issues um, were um, quite interesting this year because uh, we had some problems acquiring backbone hardware, um, which was quite serious. Um, usually, we had uh, a sponsor who who lent us a ton of equipment that we can that we could use, and that we had everything from one source, and that was really easy. We just sent a wish list, and we got everything we wanted, and we could um, build the nice network with many features that we didn't really need, but just made it fun to have. Um, this year, however, um, the sponsor had already agreed to do the same thing again, but then they had some internal difficulties, so they couldn't do that, and we learned that basically one week prior to build up. So I got a phone call, and we basically were left without any backbone equipment. Um, so it was back to the roots. Um, what have we done the years before? Uh, we called many people, and we got many offers uh, from amazing folks who helped us out. Um, uh, we decided uh, that basically everyone in the NOC would bring his fritz box, and it would be fine. <laughs> <coughs> Um, so the temperatures were fine in all rooms. Uh, the fritz boxes don't have uh, that much energy to, to dissipate. Um, so this happened. <laughs> um, now, what we seriously did was um, some emergency planning. We got help from many amazing companies, especially uh, we have to thank TMAX, uh, who are a Nuremberg a company. Um, they've been incredibly helpful um, arranging stuff from their storage, um, talking to people if we can use their stuff. And uh, we spent many hours on the phone late in the evening with a man from TMAX, so that was really helpful. Thanks for that. Um, other companies helped as well, um, especially Huawei uh, via the company called 10ICT, who lent us uh, some routers. Um, SecureLink, uh, which is another Netherlands company. Um, helped us with equipment and e kicks uh, lent some uh, uh, they, they've lent a big router and switch um, uh, which we used in the data center so what we ended up with in the end uh, was this equipment it's uh, basically <laughs> Basically, it's a it's a it's a mixture of many vendors, which made the network very interesting uh, to build. But it worked out pretty nicely in the end. Uh, we we even got the Force 10 router, the E600, which we had first used at 23 C3, um, which we got from a friend of mine, uh, well, a friend of us. Um, the good thing about that is we don't have to give it back. Um, so that was really useful. Uh, yeah, you want to continue in the backbone? Yeah, sure. Uh, hello? Is this thing on? Okay. Uh, I think that's working now. Thank you. Um, yeah, with all the equipment we got in, we went in and did basically within one week a complete redesign of the backbone we, we, we had. We knew, of course, in which patch rooms we needed to go and uh, how many ports we need in each patch room, but uh, the whole VPLS routed setup we had in before was, oh yeah, this is, uh, m maybe you can see it in the first two rows, or if you have really sharp eyes out in the, in the, in the back rows, but uh, yeah, it's also later on the slides. So yeah, we went in and uh, redesigned the whole, uh, the whole backbone, basically. We, this year, we just did a simple layer two backbone, no VPLS, nothing fancy. We just needed to get it running. <coughs> the routing was done mostly usually on the Huawei's in the larger patch rooms. And uh, we were, as in the uh, since we've been here in the, IP, in the CCH, actually, we've been in the data center of IPHH, where we were connected to upstream ISPs and had a four times 10 gig WDM back, uh, backlink to the CCH here. 
And then we had a couple of um, upstream ISPs too. Uh, for, the for, uh, for the first time, we had 10 gig from Deutsche Telekom here in CCH. So for the first time since we've been here, we had actually redundancy on the uplink. If uh, the uplink to, uh, to the IPHH would fail, we would have still 10 gig to, to Deutsche Telekom for, for internet traffic here in the CCH, which was pretty cool to have. And then at IPHH, we were connecting to ECIX, um, Internet Exchange Point, to Kaya Global, KPN, and LWLCOM, our uh, uh, three other upstreams. And uh, at ECIX, we were mostly doing peering with the route server. Later on, there came uh, peering sessions to Kabel Deutschland. And we had two peering requests from one ISP, which didn't set up the IPDBGP session, actually. So uh, we, we're still waiting for it. They have still a couple of hours before we shut down our equipment, so maybe we'll get it in the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, with all the, well, all the actually quite big ISPs we had as an upstream, we had the... Uh, some problems or not some ch uh, challenges, difficulties, balancing between those uplinks. We were moving around traffic a bit from one, uh, from Rome, some ASs from one uplink to the other and stuff like that uh, to, to, to balance it out and to find, a good, uh, find good connectivity basically for all of you. And in the end, I think we managed to do this and uh, we had quite a few complaints and uh, the DDoSs were coming in pretty fast too, so I guess we were pretty success success successful with that. So after all those years, we used the E600, um, basically many years in Berlin, then we didn't use it in the CCH, and we used it at Kemp again uh, this year. Um, we finally found its limits, um, because this, this was always like that one box that always stood up to the challenges of the Congress, um, but this year... Um, I think we, we filled its TCAM table, uh, which couldn't hold more than 16,000 IPv6 neighbor entries. Um, well, it's basically, you, you have th three entries per device, so it's not this many entries, basically. So that device was just too small to hold all the, all the v6 traffic. Um, but yeah, we could um, mitigate that by moving v6 routing to another device we still had lying around, so that worked. Um, Another issue was that for the first time, uh, we actually had a DDoS. Uh, so someone tried to attack our network from the outside. Um, uh, basically, they filled two of our 10 gig uplinks with uh, DNS amplification traffic. Uh, so that was one evening of some issues for us. It was, uh, it was uh, going against one of the Colo servers. So. We don't really know if they were trying to attack the event or some specific server they didn't like. But we could mitigate that with the help of our upstream knocks, so that worked. Um, what we tried to do with KPN this time, which is one of our uplinks, um, is to run a 100 gigabit connection to them. Um, they, ar they arranged hardware especially to do that test with us. Um, and we arranged hardware to, that, to do that, but in the end it didn't work well. We tried some, we suspected a broken optic, uh, so Flex Optic sent us another one, um, which didn't work e either, so we are suspecting currently a broken line card in their router or something. Um, but yeah, in the end we were stuck with, uh, with your grandmother's 10 gigabit Ethernet again. <laughs> um, but that's fine, we don't need all the bandwidth, it just would have been nice to test the, the technology. Uh, Marcus? Um, yeah. <clears throat> and then we had some problems, uh, problems with IPv6 routing on the Huawei's. Basically, they were working quite fine in most locations, but in, uh, in one of the patch rooms where we had a lot of VLANs terminated, they were, it seems like they were running out of CAM, basically, which is uh, the memory where the addresses are stored in. And uh, we noticed that it was mostly for IPv6 only. We had packet, uh, strange packet loss on some VLANs, not on others. So it, it was quite a hard problem to debug and to, to find out eventually. And uh, when, we, when we figure out that it's, it, it has to be CAM related, we were moving uh, most of the routing of the one patch room back to the E600, which uh, made sure that it was still below 16,000 uh, neighbors, of course. 
and then suddenly um, the latency went back to normal on the IPv6 networks and everything was working quite fine. We didn't really find out what happened there, but uh, it had to be something like that. And we had the same problem basically with the Wi-Fi network where uh, we had uh, almost like, well, we have the numbers later, 8,000 something users in there. Um, so we were routing that uh, at the beginning on the, on the E600, basically, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah on, the, on the E600, and uh, there we, have, we were running and became issues too. Then we were moving this actually to an MX, MX80, so moving about around a little bit of locally routed traffic, but then it was fine. And uh, then uh, in between there were some people trying to be funny and sending some stuff to our monitoring servers, which took down uh, some of the monitoring for some time, but uh, eventually we found, we found out that too, and were uh, blocking the, the IP addresses, and then we could see that all the network was working anyways, so <laughs> that was fine too. Yeah, and then we have some, <laughs> uh, some random notes, so to speak. We were, no we were noticing that the Facebook traffic was really, really low. It didn't, it didn't get into the top, top 200 of the ass stats. Yeah, we were, we were joking that the most Facebook traffic we've seen was that one visitor walking around in a Facebook shirt. <laughs> <laughs> And actually, on a quite interesting note, there was more V6 traffic from Facebook than V4 traffic. So that's good, too, somehow. Um, for the colo, we saw this year some requirements. Oh, yeah, we need this like uh, 10 times, 10, 10, 10 gig. No, it wasn't 10 times. But some people wanted to actually have multiple 10 gig channels for their, uh, for their servers. I mean, we are quite happy to provide connectivity in Colo. We are quite happy to provide the Colo and do anything we can to, to provide bandwidth there. But uh, there, are, there are some limits. So we think, uh, at least at this, for this Congress, 10 gig was quite enough for one server in the Colo. <laughs> so <laughs> especially, I mean, you, you, uh, the people couldn't know that we had this problem with the backbone and everything else. But still, I mean, please keep your requirements aligned with reality. <laughs> That's all what we're saying. <laughs> Uh, we learned some interesting new facts that, well, people couldn't tell us when we asked. Um, uh, we have OM2 multi-mode fiber in this building, and with the hectic arrangement of um, hardware before the build-up, um, we had a situation when, where we had to run 40 gigabit Ethernet links um, between some sites. Um, well, we would have only needed 10, but we had the equipment only for 40 gigabits. Um, <laughs> So we had to figure out whether those links would work over this fiber that's not designed for this kind of use. Um, uh, the, the, the stuff is specified to run uh, for 100 meters over OM3 fiber, which is better fiber than we have. Um, and we were able to get it working for 190 meters uh, on the bad fiber we had. So that, that was nice to learn. Uh, yeah, another interesting fact that's barely visible in the slides due to a formatting fuck up. Um, the maximum outgoing traffic um, was 21.4 gigabits per second. Uh, people always ask for that number, which is uh, about four gigabits more than last year. So it's steadily increasing. Here's a pretty graph. Um, that's just, it just shows um, the load on our backbone links. Uh, we just noticed that an hour ago, it would be fun to show. Um, this is where we announced the end of the colo, or the shutdown of the colo. So basically, all of you walked to the colo and probably got their servers out. So most of our traffic is gone now. <laughs> Wi-Fi? Wi-Fi. We have Wi-Fi. <laughs> No, but, but really, we have Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> what we were uh, using this time, uh, the same as last year, uh, were Aruba controllers uh, to, to um, high in a high, val high availability setup with uh, 10 gig links uh, uh, to, towards the, the core. We had uh, deployed 145 access points throughout the building. In uh, all over the building, we saw um, 20,000 unique clients, 
and uh, had a peak of 8,150 clients. So it's not over 9,000. Yeah. <laughs> Our Wi-Fi wi team didn't deliver on that, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> <We're> sorry. <laughs> Um, uh, on a really serious note, we saw 40% of clients on, on the unencrypted network, which we really couldn't explain because we were actually trying to push the people on the encrypted Wi-Fi. We had the 32C3 uh, SSID and the 32C3 open SSID, and somehow 40% were ending up on the unencrypted open network. Although we provided an Android app to configure the encrypted network, we had profiles for Apple and Windows, and uh, basically we did everything we could just to, to get the people using the encrypted Wi-Fi, and still 40% decided, oh no, YOLO. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe next year we see a decrease in this number. It would be quite fun, actually. Uh, the obligatory username statistics, because uh, as you know, you can choose any name you want. <laughs> Number seven is an, is an improvement from last year. It was on <laughs> number 11. <laughs> Device statistics, um, this time Linux has one. Um, <laughs> together with Android. <everyone. laughs> um, and traffic statistics, uh, we saw an average of three gigabit per second um, coming from the Wi-Fi, which is, well, it's a sum of received and transmitted data. Um, peak of 4.5 gigabits. Um, so one and two were the most busy areas, of obvi obviously. Um, they, they had the peak of 1.75 gigabits uh, per second. Um, so we, in, in, this, in this deployment, we see a much higher average bandwidth, us uh, bandwidth usage per user than in normal rollouts of this size. So it means uh, you guys are much more active on the internet for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, we can see this in this pretty graph too. That's the, uh, the airtime usage on 5 gigahertz in SAL 1. So basically, everything is u in use. We don't have any spare. Uh, spare frequency ends anymore, and uh, yeah, we're we're trying to uh, we're, tr we're tr actually trying to push as much traffic as is physically possible through those wavelengths, uh, through those uh, um, frequencies that we that we have. Uh, so this year, our, our wireless people decided to try. Uh to try to build a probe system so they can actually monitor the, the quality of the Wi-Fi they've built. Um, well, before we could just monitor them by, uh, do we have complaints from the users? But this time we have actual measurements, um, so data. Which, uh, they've built five open WRT devices with WPA supplicant uh, installed. And then they, they've run automated tests on them for ICMP ping checks, uh, can we get a DHCP lease? Um, let's try to download this file via HTTP and see how long it takes, things like that. So what you can see is, uh, well, the, the, the download speed was limited to 15 megabit per second, and during nighttime when the rooms were empty, um, you could actually get the speed. Um, but once people would come in, the speed would drop. So that's, a, that's interesting data to have uh, when, uh, while designing the network for the next event or something. <clears throat> we had a bit, a bit of problems in the Wi-Fi 2, of course, or challenges. We had uh, some performance issues uh, with the E600 on the first day, uh, which were, was adding, uh, because it was running out of cam, apparently, a lot of latency to the, to the wireless network and basically to, to most of the, net, uh, to the network traffic that's going through it. Uh, when we uh, moved the traffic away from the E600, the throughput uh, doubled basically uh, um, after day one. So we figured out then that we reached the limits of the E600, what, you, what we were telling you before already. And um, we were hitting the physical limits in the Saal 1, 2, and 3 most of the time with the channel utilization you just, you just saw. So we either need more spectrum or a more efficient usage of the spectrum that we already have. 
And uh, in this regard, um, our, our Wi-Fi team is asking if there are some people who have knowledge of this area of running a Wi-Fi network for uh, how many have you? 12,000, 15,000 people. <laughs> and uh, with, with the bandwidth we're having, uh, they'd like to talk to you about how this can be done, if you have any ideas or whatever. You can get, get in contact to us. I mean, this doesn't, of course, uh, you, you can still talk to us, but we don't really need an experience for someone who has like a Fritz box at home. We still have this experience ourselves, so of course. <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, we really need uh, like the, the experience of, pe of engineers and people who are running this high capacity networks with, with lots and lots and lots of users and bandwidth. <laughs> and the, the last uh, problem we had was the, uh, the false radar detection. We had this last year already. We were presenting it, a bit, uh, talking a bit, a little bit about it. Basically, when there's uh, some noise going in on one frequency, the Wi-Fi just, wi just, just shuts down because it's thinking, oh, there's uh, like radar uh, from uh, from the from the airport, um, uh, traffic control or whatever, coming in, and then it shuts and it needs to shut down. Uh, this is a, a known bug in the Arubas or uh, uh, something like that. I guess, <laughs> and um, it's, st it's still not fixed. We're we are still, see still seeing these problems, but uh, apparently it's got better in the newer devices, which we didn't have or didn't have that much from, right? 50%, okay, so 50% of the people were <laughs> be able to uh, continue using the Wi-Fi when those events come in, which is not too bad. Um, another topic is the people who, who we need to thank. <laughs> We couldn't get a better picture, sorry. So we would really like to thank the kind folks from the Knock Help Desk who, who always are our firewall. Um, they just take all your requests and complaints and they try to help you guys and they forward the serious stuff to us so that, uh, well, we have actually time to work on the network. So thanks for that. And on a last note, um, the traditional thanking to the sponsors, because these are the companies who actually make this event possible. Um, it's especially in a situation like uh, this year when we were left without equipment, um, basically. Um, it was good to have so many companies that you can still rely on who would jump in or who would still provide their other stuff of, of their respective areas. Um, so thanks for that again. All right, I think we're done. Are there any questions? <laughs> hey, so thanks very much for the, for the great work. Um, just two quick questions on the Wi-Fi in, uh, in, uh, in Saal 1. How many access points did you have in Halle 1 in, in total? And uh, I was just wondering, per access point, were you using only a single channel per access point, or can the access points have several channels at the same time on? Thanks. Marianne, want to go on that? <laughs> Here's our Wi-Fi man. Um, so we were using 18 access points in SAL 1, and um, though those were using uh, pretty much all of the uh, 20 megahertz wide, uh, 5 gigahertz channels. Oh, so they were on different channels, yes. So each access point has one 5 gigahertz radio, so it will, will uh, use up one 20 megahertz channel. I guess it's also the controller solution, right? They, I mean, they see each other and they distribute the... the or did, did we assign it statically? Static. Statically, okay, yeah. I'm being told there's another question from the signal angel. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, the most... Interesting question is, how did you get peering with Deutsche Telekom? <laughs> it was actually transit, not, not just peering. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, we asked some folks. <laughs> okay, so it's not repro reproducible. Well, we hope to reproduce it next year, but we'll see.
Yeah, you can. I, I can't. I have another one, which is, uh, why is the wiki down? <laughs> I'd like to stress this this year again. We do not run events that see the CD. <laughs> and um, I guess the last question from the internet is uh, what funny thing did some users do against the monitoring system? Uh, some blah, I don't remember. There was some weird packets that put heavy load in the machine or something. Synflot, apparently. Okay, Synflot, easy. <laughs> hmm, yeah. Um, a few years ago, Nadia Hanninger and I did a study where we found thousands and thousands of devices all over the internet that had weak RSA encryption keys for like SSH and TLS because of bad random number generators, and we could compromise all of them for that reason. And um, I'm, I'm wondering whether uh, you guys can, can help us with this because um, a very large fraction of them were Fritz boxes. <laughs> 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 we are, we, we're returning all our fridge boxes, so we don't have to do anything with fridge boxes anymore. <laughs> um, do you think next year you could uh, discourage use of the unencrypted Wi-Fi more by giving the SSID a less innocuous name, like open, instead and call it like unencrypted or insecure or something? Unsafe or something yeah, we like can that. try that. We, 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 we've we do have some success uh, discouraging people from using the 2.4 gigahertz networks by giving it the legacy or even slow name or something. <laughs> so that works, yeah, we can probably do better than that. Make it hidden. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> okay, one more. Uh, wireless question, specifically hall one. To get the network working, do you run the access points at full power or do you have to reduce it to make the cells smaller? Yeah, we have to reduce the transmit power, so we, uh, we, we get cells that overlap uh, the least as possible. Thank you. I was wondering, next year, would it be possible to get better Wi-Fi coverage in the bathrooms? <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, this was on our list for this year. <laughs> So I'm not quite sure what failed there, but well, we're we are aware, <laughs> and we're sorry. Yeah. Do you try to turn off the uh, unencrypted network? Uh, well, we didn't try that. We know what would happen, but um, we don't really want to. But we would like to discourage users, um, but we still want to provide uh, connectivity for people who. I don't know, it's, it's a hacker event, right? So if you want, you should be able to, s well, s have your data sniffed or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more question from the signal angle. Yeah, how many abuse messages did you get? I'm sorry, I don't have this number this, year, this time around. Oh. <laughs> Kai is coming. Oh, <laughs> our abuse handling person is uh, coming. So it is. Hello? Hello. Scroll, scroll. Uh, 248 mails were like 95% are automated about port scans because it's still just used for stupid port scans in the network most of the time. And we had, I think, roughly 10 calls where one was more or less serious and the other ones were like really unimportant and easy to fix. I've got one of those calls. Someone has sent a spam email. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, of course, not a good thing to do, but yeah. <laughs> Okay. Thank Are we you done? very much. I think we're done. Okay, all right. Okay, all right. Um, who's next? Blank stairs.
Yeah, that looks like a VOC review. So, if have any people left the room? Do we have new free seats? I see, I see two over here, one over here. Because we have people standing in the back so they can find a seat. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, just, you know, keep coming, keep finding the free seats. People keep their hands up. All right, then uh, please give it up for the VOC review. All right, hi. Um, is this on? Is it? Oh, yeah, now it is. Okay, so. Um, as some of you might know, last year we were more or less a virus operation center with half our team like falling victim to the Congress Seuche. Uh, we tried to do better this year and <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it more or less worked. Uh, we have like a few sh sore throats, but no casualties this year, so I think we did all right. So the setup was more or less similar to last year. We, we had um, in the uh, in each of the halls, we had like two to three cameras, three in the two first two halls and two in hall six and hall G, uh, being mostly mixed or being mixed with uh, hardware video mixers and uh, lots of equipment in between, which mostly came from uh, which mostly was made by uh, Blackmagic Design, uh, so video mixers, signal conversion like converting HDMI to SDI and uh, scaling and stuff and backup recording to SSDs and so on. Um, we got requests to like talk more about how the actual signal flow looked like, so I, I included one of the pictures in, uh, from Hall 2. Um, so we, um, I'll use the cursor probably. So uh, this is where the uh, speakers insert well, the, the speaker signal gets inserted, um, which goes to a, a switcher, which uh, also outputs uh, to the uh, projector and can also loop back to the video mixer, which is connected to cameras. Um, I can't read that. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, and there's a scaler for feeding back the... Uh, output from the screen to the uh, uh, video mixer as well, so we can take the info beamer, which is the uh, thing which plays during the breaks, uh, uh, to and put it on the stream as well. Um, <coughs> one thing we, we do, which might not be obvious if, if, if you haven't done video stuff before, is that we uh, embed the audio signal later in the chain. So uh, the video mixing itself happens without the audio. And we have a central, I have a slide, uh, the next slide is about that. We have a central place where all the audio from all the halls gets uh, 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 collected and mixed and redistributed. And we only embed the audio after the mixing, which uh, makes a lot of things easier, but also causes problems from time to time because um, you like have it's it's not local. So if there's a problem in the hall, you have to call up to the uh, central centrale audio regie we call it, um, and talk to them. And that's uh, that caused some problems, but we were able to fix most of them, at least in the uh, releases, if not in the streams. Yeah. So. Um, this, then we split the signal to uh, one backup recording, which is just recording everything on, on SSDs. We <coughs> hope we don't have to use that, but it has saved us a couple of times this year already, and we had that the previous years as well. And then uh, they go to two separate boxes, one of which does the recording, and the other one does uh, the streams. So, yeah, and this is the control panel for the... Oh, that's not... The control panel for the mixer. So that's Hall 2, which is slightly more complex than Hall G or Hall 6. Hall 1 is mostly similar. Oh, and we also have a GoPro input, with, which is the one in the front for if somebody has to or wants to show something uh, like hardware or so on. So yeah, I think I covered everything more or less. 
All right, um, we also have, that's the only picture I got. Uh, we have, a, a, like I said, a big uh, audio uh, mixer which collects all the audio signals and uh, all the translation signals as well, so we can uh, uh, balance the levels after, uh, after uh, the um, audio uh, mixing done by the CCH uh, itself so we can react more quickly and do some stuff which wouldn't be possible otherwise like ducking in the in the uh, translation uh, uh, streams and so on um, we also did the uh, zendet centrum this year again we we already had that last year and we uh, decided to do some well experimental stuff or research we wanted to have a, a software video mixer which can do hd uh, for the smaller, smaller conferences we do over the course of the year. And uh, we, uh, or one of our team was uh, developing such a video mixer, which, we call, which is called Voctomix. Uh, it is based on GStreamer, and we uh, decided, well, uh, we have to try it sometimes. So, uh, well, we actually tested it before, of course, but this was really the first big conferences where, uh, conference where it was in use. And it worked uh, surprisingly well. We had some minor uh, hiccups, but uh, I think uh, n there was no lasting damage, as in all the recordings got through. So uh, if, you, uh, if you'd like to uh, see how, or y if you need a uh, HD-capable uh, software video mixer, uh, it's open source. We can, uh, you can go there and uh, please send patches and, and so on. Um, so, about the recordings, um, we had uh, about 133 hours worth of talks in all the halls together, so that's, um, that doesn't include uh, Zendet Centrum because uh, that was tracked in another project in our internal system. Uh, this is only Hall 1 to G and 6. Um, we do releasing eight in eight formats, so uh, we do HD releases, SD releases, each of those in MP4, which is H2, H.264 and AAC, and WebM, which is, uh, in our case, uh, VP8 and uh, Vorbis. We also do audio-only uh, releases, and because, um, well, um, m most of you, when they, uh, if you go to media CCCD and watch the, or try to watch the talk in your browser, uh, you might notice that you get uh, a random, like either the translation or the original uh, uh, audio signal. Um, and this, this actually depends on the browser you're using and, and uh, the face of the moon and whatnot. <laughs> uh, it's actually the only browser which handles multi language or multiple audio tracks in, in video files on the web correctly is IA10. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so that's pretty sad. So we also have to, we also demux, uh, we create additional releases which only contain single audio tracks to, to cater to broken browsers. So if you have issues like that, uh, playing, playing, getting the wrong audio or something, just download the file and try, a, try VLC or something. So in the end, this amounted to uh, more than a thousand hours of encoding and, 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 and uh, actual files ending up on, on, on various servers. Uh, if you have uh, in CPU time, that's probably about like five or 3,000 hours of encoding time. All right, um, the reasoning status, we, this year we were able to, or we were allowed to record almost all talks uh, but one, which was the, the play in, in Hall 1. Um, uh, when I, when I uh, made the slides, uh, we released uh, we already had released 130 of those 152 talks. Uh, this number is probably higher uh, by now. <laughs> uh, we'll try to get most of or uh, as many talks as we can out uh, to, uh, until we have to leave and until the, the network gets cut down. Um, so we hope that, well, mo most of them will ha come out today and the rest will hopefully come out soon once the, our hardware has traveled to its home again and uh, um, has we've gone to the rest of the releasing process. So the talks which are not going to be released today will ho hopefully happen in the next one or two weeks uh, tops. 
Um, yeah, so you can go to mediaccc.de, or uh, we also publish the talks on YouTube. All right, uh, streaming, on the other hand, um, uh, it was pretty similar to last year. We uh, dropped, uh, finally, we, uh, we felt comfortable dropping RTMP. <laughs> So only HLS and WebM, with the majority of the, the uh, viewers actually going to WebM because uh, browsers, uh, the only browsers which natively support HLS are Apple devices. So that was about uh, 10 to 20 percent, I think. And this year we'll also be able to offer HTTPS on all relays, like uh, for the website itself, but also for the stream. People came to us for the past few years and requested that. So we built that this year. And uh, that was mainly possible thanks to Let's Encrypt because we have lots of servers and like going, either getting like huge amounts of wildcard certificates or going to uh, uh, going to the process of getting like 50 different certificates by copy pasting CSRs somewhere, just isn't fun. So Let's Encrypt made that easy for us. Uh, that was quite nice. So this is how, uh, how CDN looked like. Uh, the uh, service you see in the bottom, that's 17 if I didn't miscount, is the ones which were serving streams uh, to the users. Uh, this is our source, which is in, in, in a, in, in a uh, co-location space here in, in, in CCH. And we have a distribution layer which uh, just handles the load uh, of actually pushing the data to the edge relays because uh, one edge relay gets fed with approximately 300 megabits just uh, the uh, all the streams so we can't uh, do s uh, 17 times 300 from just one server so that's why we have this distribution layer um, one of those uh, was in uh, two of those servers were in, in in the United States actually so people coming from the United States were pushed to a local server. We also had a, a server in, inside this building uh, and also went to pushing um, people from uh, 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 3233 uh, to that local server to ensure that you don't have, uh, or you have like less, uh, less round trip time, more or less. Um, Peak FIFA is still a thing. Um, so uh, you can see Peak FIFA over there. That was uh, like five and a half thousand viewers in uh, Hall One. Uh, we also have a little uh, Peak Jeopardy over here. Uh, yeah. So uh, we ended up uh, at, uh, um, serving almost 20 gigabits of streams uh, at the peak, and uh, well, less than an average. So something like 10 gigabits, which, which was uh, 10 gigabits on average during a normal day, which was quite a bit more than last year. So, uh, yeah. Um, one of the reasons is that we actually uh, enforced HD by default. Last year we, we had HD as an upgrade path, so to say, um, and well, that seemed to have worked. We uh, pushed more than 100 terabytes of stream data to users altogether. And it, as it turns out, streaming to <laughs> Deutsche Telekom isn't really fun. Um, we uh, had to actually push uh, telecom uh, customers to a specific subset of servers which had uh, less than shitty peering to uh, uh, telecom. So, um, um, yeah, and actually most of the telecom traffic was served from CCH itself via the uh, knock link, so uh, thanks for that. That has helped a lot. So there are a few other teams which are, well, not exactly the video team, but related. So I, I collected some statistics from them as well. So first as the subtitling team, uh, which uh, this year again uh, so did live subtitling in halls one and two. And they subtitled 82 talks, which was all of them. Um, and the number of characters they typed was 2,014,021. <laughs> Uh, 
they had about, uh, I didn't get these numbers in time for the slides, so I'll just say them. They had like 60 angels which uh, did that, so that was great as well. And uh, speaking about angels, uh, we had like video uh, angels manning the cameras and the video mixers and so on. Uh, that was about 250, so uh, well done. Thank you. I tried to call the translation team, but uh, their phone just uh, didn't, uh, didn't, uh, uh, or they didn't answer the phone, so I uh, pulled this, these statistics out of our recording system. Uh, so these are not complete, but they give you a rough idea how, 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 the, how uh, the translations were distributed. So we had uh, three German talks which weren't translated and nine English talks. Uh, but comparing that with uh, 105 English talks which were translated to German and 19 German talks which were translated to English, that's a pretty good uh, ratio, I think. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and also, this is, uh, I think it's the first time we actually released uh, uh, um, a video with uh, three audio tracks, so that's uh, originally German, translated to English, and also translated to uh, Schweizerdeutsch. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Uh, that was the uh, yesterday's Hacker Jeopardy, if I'm not mistaken, so if you want to watch that. All right, um, so if you want to know more details about the, how the post-processing works and so on, you can go to our wiki. Um, the setup described there is not exactly what we do on Congress, but many of the parts are still the same. So there's some documentation there, and there's also a talk from Proscon linked, uh, which explains some of that. So um, see you at Easter Hack, and... Have a nice day. All right. So we're going to start switching speakers already and might do one or two very quick questions because we are running low on time. So if you have a question, I mean, Signal Angel, go ahead. You already have a mic. Uh, the first question from the internet is uh, still buffering. Um, what were the audio problems during the opening event? Um, <laughs> uh, he would be able to explain more about that, but um, uh, the audio problems during opening. Can magic you? Black magic. Yeah, uh, some, some magic happened and uh, it didn't do the magic anymore, so. Um, yeah. Any other questions here? Yeah. Uh, did you think about uh, broadcasting the streams on DVB-T? Yeah, we thought about that. Like we, we tried that last Congress uh, in preparation for camp, and we um, ended up deciding not to uh, do that this year inside the building because it's not really all that useful, and we uh, because in propagation of radio inside a building is not all that good, and um, the well the idea during 31C3 was to evaluate the technical problems and we managed that so we didn't do that. We were thinking about doing broadcast like putting an antenna on top of the building and broadcasting to Hamburg <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that uh, didn't happen because of license, uh, um, well, uh, uh, radio license issues but we might try that next year. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, I think we are running out of time and to give the other teams uh, chances to speak we're gonna uh, move to the GSM review All right. hello 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 yes okay good thanks so GSM we had a um, uh, we had a test network again this year but um, there, there there's a GSM spectrum situation in Germany at the moment so the regulatory body the Bundesnetzagentur they in 2015 auctioned away the test um, spectrum, the, the decked guard band that is between the frequencies used for GSM and the frequencies used for decked handsets. So because this spectrum is in between the two ranges, it's, it's traditionally been held free because, you know, there might be some, they might sort of bleed into each other. Anyway, now it's gone, it's auctioned off, and um, so we couldn't apply for a test license. Well, we could apply, but we wouldn't get one. And it looked really bad. Uh, it looked like we would get no spectrum at all. 
and uh, so Harald Welter, one of the Osmocom developers, he, he wrote a blog post about this and uh, a few days later, uh, well, saying in his blog post that it seemed like we would be able to have no network actually because of this situation. And a few days later, he was able to write another very good blog post saying that we would have a, a, a network uh, because he um, got um, some, some, some contacts from, or uh, somebody from Vodafone got in touch and said, well, actually this isn't being used just yet. So it's all right for you to, uh, to use it one more time. They gave us permission and we applied at uh, the Bundesnetzagentur and we were assigned, um, assigned one more test license. So that was, that was great. <laughs> we had seven, well, some of them are still up. We had seven BTSs operating in the building. That's uh, a little bit less than we've had previous years. They were each on their own um, ARFCON, uh, their own frequency in the 1800 megahertz band, one in the rooms, uh, one, two, and G, the larger room upstairs, one in the GSM room upstairs, one outside here in the foyer, and one two stories up, and one over in the hack center. So we did some new things this year. Uh, we implemented half rate, the half rate audio codec, which means that we were able to uh, accommodate twice as many calls as, as previously, that's good. Now there's also an open source, uh, working open source implementation of this, which um, was indeed uh, finished during, during Congress now. And <laughs> and we also operated GPRS for the whole event uh, on one time slot on each BGS. So that's uh, one eighth of the frequency capacity was reserved for packet data and this, this, uh, this was used and it, it worked. <laughs> the, the thing is, so you, you, if you do this, you have, to, uh, you have to determine in advance how, many, how much uh, frequency spectrum you're going to allocate to packet data versus uh, phone calls. And that's sort of fixed. It's not so easy to do that dynamically. So um, we started small and, and let's see what happens. So we had some, some subscribers. I'll, um, show a graph in a bit, uh, lots of SIM cards and uh, no stupid bots this year. That's, that's good. Peak activity, uh, 66 calls in within a minute was the maximum load on the network and uh, 38 SMS uh, messages sent within one minute. The total number of SMS messages, 15,939. So well done and um, it seems that about 450 or so of them didn't actually deliver, uh, didn't arrive at their destination. Maybe the phone was switched off for too long or nobody, there was no subscriber with that particular number, who knows. Uh, there was some GPRS traffic as well, not, uh, no gigabytes, <laughs> right? But megabytes, at least, at least something. Let's start small. Uh, 116 or so megabytes received by the network, so sent by, um, by devices, and 475 megabytes transmitted by the network, so received by the, 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 the devices. And some, some pretty graphs. This is a snapshot from, from a little while ago. The, the three on top I already went through. That's the number of active subscribers and the total uh, number of sent messages in GPRS traffic. And on the bottom, you see the, the channel load, so the, the, the activity uh, of each BTS, uh, each of the seven BTSs that we were using. Finally, so what about next year? Uh, we don't really know. It doesn't look that great. And um, the, we're, it's, it's pretty certain that Vodafone is going to be using the, the, their spectrum that they've acquired next year. And um, mm -hmm, sad, sad, sad panda, sad face. Uh, if you have uh, any way to, to help us out with some spectrum in um, downtown Hamburg between Christmas and New Year's in 2016, then we would love to talk to you. And, and this is really, this is really an, uh, a unique and important opportunity to exercise the open source uh, software and hardware that we have for cell phone technology. I know I, maybe you catched, uh, caught Harold's talk on, on the new 3G work that is, is slowly um, 
coming off the ground. And I, by next year, I, I would be super excited to see that um, implemented. Now, um, I mentioned, yeah, so, so if you can help, please get in touch. I mentioned SIM cards. Uh, as it turns out, we found uh, half a box of SIM cards left over. So if you're interested in those, come find me after, um, after the talk. That's it for me. I guess we can take some questions. Yeah, so we are going to start switching speakers already. And in the meantime, take a few questions. So if you have a question in the room, run to one of the microphones. If the signal angel has one, he waves his hand like he does right now. Um, yeah, uh, the question, a question is, were there any special uh, services provided via GPRS and were there Congress uh, WAP pages? Still remember that? There were no special services implemented by, by us and uh, there was no WAP uh, content provided, but if you're interested in, in doing so, please please get in touch and, and we'll we'll make sure to set something up. Oh, there's one thing, one more thing I should mention about the SIM cards. Uh, they so the SIM cards from 31C3 a year ago, uh, the ones from camp this summer, and the ones from this event, they are all Java cards. And um, if you're interested in acquiring the the keys on these cards. Uh, get in touch with us. We can we can give them to you if you want to implement, for example, some um, some SIM toolkit um, applets. And there's some some source code that was released just before Congress as well. In if, if you're interested to work on that. Okay, perfect. Maybe one one final very quick question. Have you tried uh, to combine the text messages from the voice over IP with the SMS? Because well, uh, that didn't work, I think. But it could be interesting. Have we tried to combine text messages over over packet? You mean? Yeah, there is a voice over IP also to call, and uh, but you can also send uh, text messages with that protocol. But uh, do you mean it was SIP? not possible to send SMS? Do CPS. you mean SIP text messages? Yes. Okay. Uh, no, we haven't tried that. There is no no SIP to to GS, uh, SIP to SMS gateway. Yeah. That's also an, an interesting Could project interesting. if anyone wants to work on that. Should be should be pretty easy. The POC uh, infrastructure is is easy to integrate with. Okay, thank you. Okay, perfect. You are the last question. One sentence question. One sentence answer. My question is, uh, what kind of hardware was involved in this entire network? I'm mostly interested in the BTS. Uh, the hardware we used are Sysmo BTS, Sysmo BTSs. And what was the second part of your question? That I was uh, mostly interested in the BTS. All right, yeah. So the, the, the BTS is a Sysmo BTS, and um, it has an Ethernet um, connection to a server where we're running the OpenBSC open source software to control all these seven BTSs. Thank you. OK, perfect. Thanks. Thank you. And um, we technically have two minutes left for Silk Road, but we may, might run one or two uh, longer. So uh, yeah, please, Silk Road. Yeah, hi. Um, we are part of the team that uh, set up this year's Pneumatic Tube Network, but uh, we also uh, attended camp. Um, some people thought we weren't there, but we actually were. Um, our village got uh, located or moved to another spot, so we weren't able to build the network we wanted. Um, part of the reason was because um, there's, there were security ways that we couldn't cross. But uh, we didn't. Uh, we tried uh, <laughs> to cross them. Um, turns out that the uh, clay soil in Mildenberg is actually pretty hard to uh, dig trenches into. <laughs> we also have some uh, statistics from camp that we couldn't show the uh, at the last um, infrastructure review. Um, so all in all, um, there are about 118 capsules sent from our central node. Um, Unfortunately, as most of you know, there was a little downpour at the camp one of the last days. So um, our measuring hardware that we would have loved to use at uh, 32C3 uh, somewhat corroded uh, there, and uh, we weren't able to use it. So uh, this year's network uh, looks like this. It's a bit larger than uh, at last year's Congress. Um, but this year we were also able uh, to handle 
all the traffic from uh, a single central node. So um, most of you have seen the router upstairs. So it's able to route all the traffic to the central node and back to all the uh, nodes again. So uh, some new developments uh, we did. Um, for the camp, um, we actually wanted to collect the statistics from all the nodes. And since we planned a large network with uh, nodes that are far apart, we figured we needed some kind of two-wire bus that has to use cheap cable. So um, this is somewhat uh, RS485-ish uh, two-wire bus. You can check out the code on GitHub. Uh, and the hardware schematics. And this is also uh, the stuff we use to control the routers. Yeah. Yeah, because of that uh, decentral uh, or that central approach, we needed some communications. That's why some other guys set up some field phones to every station. And uh, they were heavily used, even uh, especially in the mornings when the smaller hackers were there. That was quite fun. And now nah, that's our router. It was really fun. It had <laughs> three tubes, one tube coming. <laughs> one tube coming from the hack center and three other tubes. One going to the POC, to Garderobenfoyer 2, and the other one was actually yeah, we'll come to that later. It was really fun. <laughs> because of that uh, central approach... <laughs> <clears throat> we could provide suction as a service so that, yeah, I got rid of that uh, noise problem. We had some, yeah, not no one really who who could provide an electrical switch, so we choose another approach. <laughs> yeah, and we had that third tube at the router. That was really, really fun. It was good for trolling podcasts. <laughs> because it was on the stage at the Sendezentrum. Yeah, um, <laughs> that was almost everything. We would love to, to have more, per, uh, more people who help us. If you want to help us get everything set up, come here. Come here on day minus three or so and just help. If you have nice ideas, contact us via the mailing list and yeah. <laughs>